Now that is a pretty gun right there. It's a 4570 Henry. And I'll do a, a, a bigger review on this gun. I've had this for a while now. I actually won it in a raffle. Um, I bought maybe four tickets or so to uh, support the Eastern Bison Association, which is a great conservation group when it comes to bison. But um, <laughs> four tickets and I won this incredible rifle, which, you know, somebody asked me, what was the point of having, you know, a 45 70 rifle as an auction item at a group that's trying to help with bison conservation and bring bison back. And I explained to them that if you if you want to have bison, the best way to save them is to eat them. And you also have to manage their population. So 4570 government issue was a rifle that was used a lot in taking down the bison population initially, but it's also one of the most humane ways of field harvesting a bison. You hit a bison with this cannon and it's pretty much like the bison just hit a rock wall and fell. It's pretty fast, pretty quick, and that makes this kind of an ideal gun um, for those who are raising bison or, or have to, you know, put an animal down um, for any of those reasons. And it's absolutely beautiful. Um, I love this gun. I have not actually fired it yet. So I have no idea how bad the kick is gonna be on this thing, but a 45, 70 round is, is, is pretty much a small cannon. So we'll have some fun with this, um, but in a different video. Today I wanted to talk about a, um, another situation. Wyoming, there's a pretty big story going on in Wyoming right now. Uh, thousands, over 10,000 tags were withheld by Fish and Wildlife this year for hunting in Wyoming. And another 1,200 Wyoming hunters just lost their tags in the last few weeks. And so I wanted to address that, but I also wanted to just bring your attention back to a much bigger issue when it comes to uh, hunting in the United States, because it has been, um, it's been a battle in recent years of uh, keeping the interest in hunting, especially with this, uh, with all of these anti-meat, anti-hunting, uh, pushes that have been out there, and our government has taken a pretty big stab at hunting. I did a video recently talking about, you know, no lead bullets, and people are like, well, I use, um, I use copper bullets. Copper bullets are actually a little better when it comes to hunting deer. They get um, uh, significantly better penetration for a large game. But you also have to remember a lot of bullets are just cased lead inside copper. Uh, lead is still the most affordable um, bullet on the market and um, the affordability is important. You know, people who are hunting on public lands, I have plenty of land myself. If I want to go hunt a deer, all I have to do is walk into my back pasture and I've got deer there every single night. I could shoot it with whatever I want to because it's private land. But a lot of people have to hunt on public land. And so removing accessibility by making it unaffordable in other ways um, is detrimental to uh, people's avail uh, ability to be able to go out hunt and, 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 and food sovereignty and you know things that I feel are just basic human rights. But there's more to hunting than just that. Um, another piece of legislation that was a bipartisan legislation, and a lot of us probably didn't even realize the impacts that this would have on it. It was the uh, Making uh, America Safer Act. And this act in inadvertently removed a ton of funding that goes into what they call enrichment programs within schools. So if a school had an enrichment program, uh, they lost federal funding. And this includes uh, anything from archery to hunting education. And both of these things are really important with helping to educate kids coming up who are interested in these things. And it's, it's all about safety, right? Hunting is always, always been about safety. Um, the other thing that I that I think is unfair with this act is that um, you know we've seen a lot of enrichment programs going into indigenous communities, and I think that they are fantastic. They are uh, helping indigenous youth uh, learn the ways of of, of of their elders, and and that's been taken from them over the years. And I'm not sure how this act has actually. So I don't want to say it's unfair, but I don't, I don't know how it has actually impacted their programs, but they do get a lot of federal funding and they do a lot of these enrichment programs, which also um, involve 
uh, hunting classes and archery classes. Um, so, but with, with schools across our country, these enrichment classes have been removed. And when you think about, you know, the interest in hunting year over year and the importance of bringing youth up into it, um, it's actually been falling. Um, it's, it fell just from 2022 at 81% interest down to 77% interest. So there's a, a decreasing interest in hunting and fishing. And what is happening is that U.S. Fish and Wildlife is having a hard time, the, you know, the state fish and wildlife uh, organizations are having a hard time getting the funding without the licenses, with the decreased amount of licenses to keep the programs going. And uh, it kind of a general principle of, of hunting and, and understanding that uh, way of life and understanding, you know, just beyond, you know, having your own ability to go out and connect with, with your food source and hunt it. You know, I kind of explained before, there's, there's, something, um, there's something very genuine and different between going to the grocery store and buying something that was, you know, raised in a barn versus walking out. And I, like I said, I'm 100% for agriculture. Um, I, but there's a major difference between that and going out into a habitat, hunting and, um, and building a relationship with an animal. I mean, that, there's just, there's, there's something that you're missing when that's taken away from you. But beyond that, you know, we, we understand that if, if wildlife is a resource, then there's a necessity in keeping wildlife around. There's a necessity in conservation. There are reasons beyond just, you know, going for hikes and enjoying it. I mean, hikers aren't paying for these programs. Um, was, I mean, they do through some fees, you know, but nowhere near the amount. There were 15.8 million hunting licenses sold in the U.S. in 2023. And I know that just my hunting license alone for a sportsman in North Carolina is about $90 a year. So if you multiply, and I know that everybody's not getting the sportsman license. And a lot of times I don't even hunt. You know, I pay for the license because I'm supporting the programs. I do fish a lot. And the sportsman allows me to do inland fishing, which I love trout fishing. I love fly fishing. It's my favorite thing to do. But, um, you know, these licenses, and sometimes I buy licenses in other states. We travel a lot, so I buy a lot of fishing licenses as we travel, um, especially when we get out to the Northwest. I mean, great trout fishing up there. But we're, we're, you have to imagine how much money is actually going into these programs through these fishing licenses. And by removing some of these, the, the funding for some of these educational programs, we're actually diminishing the interest in hunting even more. And eventually there's just not gonna be funding available to keep up some of these hunting programs if we keep going in the direction we're going in, which is going to impact people who rely on, on hunting to feed their families, not just you know the sportsmen that are doing it for sport, although they eat the, the meat too, they, but they could probably afford to go to the store and buy whatever it is they wanted to. Um, there are people out there who desperately rely on their ability to hunt on public lands every single year. So these type of uh, programs that have come out and now defunded because of this bill, it's actually a very big deal. Um, and believe it or not, the Biden administration has recently opened the door, the Department of Education has recently opened the door to Congress to reword the bill so that some funding can go back into those programs. So I would contact your congressman um, because this is an, it's not just about preserving a tradition or a way of life. It's about preserving the necessity of having wildlife and having that resource. Now, and, and on that note, I wanted to talk about what's going on in Wyoming because this is a good example of how conservation works and the mindset of hunters. Um, in Wyoming, you had uh, an unusually harsh winter. You know, amidst all the fears of global warming, Wyoming and the surrounding areas had extremely harsh winters. And it didn't really impact the elk population that much. The elk were able to wade through the winter uh, fairly well. Antelope lost a lot. And part of that was pneumonia. There was a pneumonia spreading across the antelope population, but there were, you know, thousands of what we call winter kill. Uh, when it comes to the mule deer population, you saw almost 80% of the adult mule deer population wiped out in some areas of Wyoming. 
in almost all of the fonts this year. So just, I mean, a tremendous impact. I mean, you have to remember, imagine there were 30,000 uh, mule deer in the, uh, in the population before the winter. And based on migratory patterns and observation of the animals as they migrate, um, they believe that in some areas up to 80% of the adult population was wiped out and the babies didn't make it at all. So there was a, a huge decrease in the population of these animals. So Fish and Wildlife came out and they cut their tags this year in Wyoming by 10,000 on, on some species. Uh, they, they cut back significantly and they increased you know, the cost of hunting licenses for people out of state, because by doing that, they're losing funding for their programs. They're losing funding for their programs, which help maintain the populations of these animals and are critical in, in, many, in, in, in many respects, they are critical to wildlife conservation, land conservation. Um, so we need the funding for those resources. Well, they, they were a group, of, there was a hunter in Wyoming who said, you know what, we're going to start a program called, you know, let a mule deer walk or something like that. And um, basically what it was is you could take your tags for mule deer and turn them in for raffle prizes. And they had some great raffle prizes. I'm sure they had, you know, some pretty fantastic guns like this one, or they had, um, things like taxidermy services. They actually auctioned off some commissioner um, tags, which would allow people to hunt anywhere in the state for any type of species, which would be a fantastic thing to have, uh, you know, in the next year when the populations have had a chance to restore themselves a little bit. Um, so they, they auctioned off some pretty awesome stuff for hunters to turn in their tags. And the objective was, okay, so you buy your tags anyway, and we're gonna to contribute to conservation by just not hunting the deer, but we're gonna have this awesome raffle where you have the chance of winning all sorts of cool prizes, and we're gonna have a fun year out of it. You know, we may not be out there hunting, and those who need to be able to hunt, I mean, obviously, they, n nobody's going to auction off their food resource unless they're really stupid raffle off, but um, they, the, the point is, is that it was, you know, the, these hunters, and. They had over 1,200, or around 1,200 hunters participate in this program who put their tags in to be raffled off. It, I mean, I believe it equated to over $50,000 of revenue for Fish and Wildlife in Wyoming. And they plan on doing it until they get the populations back to where they need it to be. And these populations can spring back fairly quickly with proper management. Um, but that's just, you know, it shows the mentality of the hunting community, the mentality of conservation that the hunting community represents. And I think that this type of news is something that's worth sharing, worth reminding people of. Um, and, you know, reminding people that hunters aren't just some barbaric people that are out there to kill. Um, they're out there because they want to have a connection with their food source. They want to have a connection with nature, with wildlife. Um, they, they, they care about preserving species. They care about taking extra steps beyond what is demanded of them, of the government, to, to do their role in making sure that populations of animals are where they need to be. And um, this is just one of those stories that is worth telling, worth sharing, and hopefully, you know, by sharing this stuff and by helping people understand, you know, the, the importance of the, the conservation side of it. You know, this is why, you know, even after the Keeping America Safe Act or whatever it was called, I don't disagree with everything in that act, but I do disagree with canceling funding for these hunting programs. And I, and I disagree with a lot of the policies in my perspective that have come out recently that take aim at hunters. Um, because this is one of the most important conservation programs in the world. Um, American hunters always have been. And they're, they're important for management, uh, population, uh, population of management, <laughs> tongue twister here today. They're important for managing the population of species. Um, and not just, you know, in, the, in this case, they're helping to bring back the species. 
They're, they they fill a lot of roles, and it's because they they view wildlife, nature as an essential resource. It, the day you take away it as a resource is the day you kill it. Um, bison are a great example of that. Bison have never made it onto the Endangered Species Act. They nearly went extinct and have bounced back to a very healthy population, almost over a half a million in recent years. Um, the, the, the drought has diminished that population a little bit, but I'm sure it will spring back. The success of that program has become, is, is based around the fact that bison have become a resource, a resource for meat, a resource for leather goods, a resource for fiber. Um, bison are an essential part of our natural resources. Native Americans have always known that. In fact, we, part of the reason why the bison population was wiped out was to wipe out their resources, right? So, but w as long as people need something as a resource, it thrives. You, you hear a lot of people say, you wanna save an animal, you wanna save a species, eat it. Because once people start eating it, once it becomes economically viable in and of itself, um, people do what they can to conserve it, to bring it back. We don't have a cattle population problem, do we? No, we don't, because it's such an important part of society, it's such an important resource. So making wildlife a resource and not just you know, a tourist attraction, but an actual resource, an actual way of life in our society uh, protects its viability into the future because people protect their resources. That's the whole point of these programs. That's the, that's the whole mindset of hunters besides the fact that, you know, you know, the hunter safety is, is important for kids with the, the lessons they teach them uh, when it comes to utilizing these quote unquote dangerous weapons. Um, they, it's, it reminds me of when I first gave my son a pocket knife. Instead of giving it to him to just carve whenever he wanted to or do little craft projects like carving soap and things like that, I had him set it by the door. And when we went outside to do work, ranch work, I let him utilize that knife before we ever started carving in cutting rope and doing projects around the ranch. I engraved into his mind that that was a tool and not a toy. That was a tool and not an arts and crafts project. Um, and I think that that makes a very big difference. He doesn't go for that knife now, but if he is doing a project where we might have to be cutting something, he will pick it up and grab it. And on the occasion when you know, we have nothing else to do. It's a nice, cool day, and we want to sit on the front porch and carve something. He'll carve something. Um, but he was trained from the beginning that that pocket knife is a tool. And that's what hunter safety courses really do. I mean, they train kids from the beginning to utilize something as a tool, as a tool to harvest food and, and, and feed themselves. Uh, and, you know, I'm sorry, but if you want to keep America safer, you would think that going through an educational process like that would actually Im improve the, the mindsets. And I don't think that there's ever, you know, when you look at the demographics of some of the things that have gone on, these aren't kids that have been through hunter safety or who have been raised in that lifestyle even. Um, a lot of the things that have happened in recent years are, well, we know that they come from different backgrounds, let's put it that way. Um, and so I, I think that there's no, there's no science behind it, but um, these are the type of programs we need to speak out against and make sure that we are preserving. Because like I said, the second you remove this stuff as a resource and it's no longer valued by a population, um, you have over 15 million hunting licenses sold in the U.S. every year. That's a large amount of our population that's defending wildlife as a resource. Think about it. So I just wanted to put that out there and congratulate these guys on what they've done because it is, uh, you know, it is admirable to spend the money. And you know, there were some people who thought they should withhold licenses altogether, uh, which wouldn't be fair to those who really do rely on it. But um, what these guys did was admirable in their own right, and they, they are helping with conservation because they value it as a resource. And they, they understand the importance of letting these populations be healthy 
at a healthy number. Um, they also, if, if there was a population that was out of control, would take action to bring it back under control. You know, when I was in Canada, they actually, uh, we met with a guy from Germany and he said in Germany, you know, the way that they, uh, they manage their wildlife is if you have a hunting license and the population of a particular species gets out of control, you could actually be held liable from the government for not taking action and depopulating that species. It's a bit of an authoritarian approach, if you ask me. But I mean, it, they even, you know, in Europe, they recognize the importance of, um, of healthy ecosystems and how to maintain that. And if you have a hunting license, at least in Germany, you are required to, to do your part, to play your role in maintaining those populations at healthy levels. And if you don't, you can be held liable. Like if I, you know, had all of a sudden just a bunch of deer invading my space as a farmer, and they started eating all the corn in my cornfield, and my neighbor was a hunter and he wasn't out there actively hunting the deer, in Germany I could sue him. And that's the reality of it. At least that's how I understood what he was explaining. Um, every country has these programs and they're there for a reason. And when we have a group of people who just deliberately continue to attack those programs, you have to start thinking about where does this take us in the future? And it doesn't take us to a bright place. If we decrease the funding for all of these programs, if we decrease the, you know, I, I do think that there is a role that we play in all of these situations, the government, the, the private citizen, the conservationist, even, you know, you, you hear it from me, even the, um, the animal rights groups, because they keep everybody in check, right? Everybody plays a role. You can't let one of those groups get imbalanced and, and push too much of their own agenda on others, because when you imbalance that system, it starts to break down. And I think that's what we're seeing today. And I think that people are feeling it. They're starting to speak out against it. And stories like what we just saw in Wyoming remind us of the importance that this community has and, and what they're willing to do to protect it.